Okay, um, forgive the voice, I've got <coughs> a bit of a cold, but firstly I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to attend this. It was a very interesting process and uh, hopefully the, the, the lessons learned and what we can transfer here will be um, exciting for everyone. So I'll get right into it. Yes, yeah, so the title of uh, what I'm going to present is the classification and detection of community acquired pneumonia. Um, by me and Dr. Piri. And so an outline of what I'm going to give is what's here. Basically, we're just going to go over an introduction to MIZ. In fact, we might just skim through that very quickly because Dr. Piri gave an introduction at the beginning there. But yeah, we're going to talk a bit about uh, AI in radiology in Zambia. We're going to talk about uh, how we source the data to create the models, how we um, implemented the models, the results in terms of uh, how good the models were and um, how the perceptions of these models and the tools which use them were by the uh, experts and we'll give a conclusion and then a very quick demo of uh, the evaluation interface we used. And so for the introduction of the AMIZ project, um, I'm just going to very quickly say that uh, Zambia has a challenge and so does the whole world. Zambia in particular has a challenge around medical image interpretation. We have a severe shortage of experts in that field. Uh, at last check, it should be 11 experts in public service serving the entire country, which is um, a ratio of more than a million uh, people in the population for each uh, radiologist, which is a serious challenge. And also the, the, the nation has continued to purchase more and more imaging equipment. And there has been, because of uh, the success of involvement of imaging, a huge increase in the need for imaging and diagnosis of patients. So this has made a huge burden. And uh, among the other things that Dr. Pierre mentioned, like policies and procedures, image analysis, software tools, one of the things we believe is a potential solution for this is introducing AI into these workflows in different aspects, but uh, I will particularly talk about the semi-automated interpretation, assisting in the interpreting of these images. And so, yeah, artificial intelligence has been a thing in radiology because radiology is one of those fields which is particularly data-driven. It's one of those fields where large amounts of data, which is uh, by its nature, because they report, is uh, a bit easier to label. And so because of that, it's one of those fields which has huge potential for implementation of AI. Another thing which pushes AI in that direction is the, the fact that it has, as I stated earlier, a severe shortage of experts. So it's one of those fields that's ripe for solutions and which will be implemented and help many people. And so, yeah, in Zambia, as I said, there are 11, or at last check, were 11 um, radiologists in public service with a severe shortage of these individuals. Now, one of the things, again, which uh, we should consider about AI, which makes it also particularly useful for radiology, is the fact that uh, radiologists have to go through a series of years of, of learning and interpreting images before they become qualified. They do this as their residents, same as other professions uh, in medicine. But one of the things that's unique about radiology is the more images you've seen, the better off you are. And it's the same thing with training models. So when you're, when you're training a model, you want to find a large data set and have it look through the data set and make uh, what we call inferences, like a, a, an educated guess as to whether this image has what we're looking for or not, or is part of a certain group of images or not. And it's a very similar thing the radiologists are doing. But one of the things that's an opportunity we have here is, uh, let's say if you have a supercomputer, and you have a normal radiologist. If you have a radiologist and they have 40 years to look at images, there's only so many images they can look at between eating and uh, carrying out the rest of the things they do in their life. Whereas if you have a sufficient computing power, an AI could look at all the images that are labeled and exist anywhere. It's legitimately possible, which means that um, if the data is available, well, you could have an AI, which is uh, particularly well trained in a particular field, which is better than any um, human interpreter ever and will ever be, right? A challenge though here with AI is that unlike humans, where if you have a radiologist, you could teach them 
on a on 500 images and they'll get the idea for for ai it's a it's a lot more challenging and also that ai is quite narrow in what it learns you it, you can't you can't um, teach it as broadly as once as you can a human so that's one of the challenges there yeah anyway another opportunity we have here in zambia is that while we are behind in these technologies now the the technologies in the world are quite advanced and we in Zambia have a chance to leapfrog certain stages the developed countries had to go through in the middle between where they were long ago and where they are now. We can adopt certain technologies straight from them and start to implement these in, in, the, in the workflows we have. And that's some of the work which uh, my colleague here will talk about. Yeah. Uh, so some of the potential applications and benefits here and number one, which is direct to the experts, is um, first and foremost, this is something which uh, the head of radiology at uh, UTH mentioned. She said there's a situation where a radiologist is looking at an image and they identify uh, a problem, but what that causes is in a human, it tends to create a bias against other problems which might also exist in the image. And that's something which uh, you could... Um, very well just for in AI. It's a very good opportunity in that regard. And also these images which come out of the, uh, what we call uh, modalities, which is the X-ray or the CT scan or whatnot, they are very high definition. And what that allows is when it's a human interpreting an image, the image has to get, I mean, sorry, the irregularity has to get large enough for that human to, to view it um, in an image. Whereas for AI, the analysis is carried out pixel by pixel, which means there's a much smaller um, area it has to cover for it to be identified, and that's a huge opportunity there. Another opportunity there is um, um, the classification of images and studies, whether they are um, into certain, you could have a model which uh, classifies as to whether this is likely in this area, in, in terms of uh, whether it's uh, an issue with uh, pneumonias or categorizing in terms of diseases to be sent to particular experts and things like that. Another huge area is assistance in the research and report generation. So what happens when an image is requested of a radiologist is it has to be interpreted and a, and a report has to be written and given to the referring physician. Now, that is another area where um, AI could come in. These reports are likely very similar in structure and with the advent of large language models, these could be used to assist in that process, making um, it a lot quicker and allowing the radiologists to interpret many more reports. And also, just like other professions, the radiologists tend to have to do a bit of research as they are interpreting images. Now, they have platforms for this, which are like encyclopedias for radiology, but it's possible to have um, assistance from large language models, specially trained on the knowledge in these platforms, which is something which would also assist them in their research and uh, make them fast. And these solutions, like what we tested, could be integrated with their uh, workflow tools. Also, emergency evaluations. Um, uh, surgeons and other practitioners have to have the capacity to interpret images very quickly. And one of the really good applications of this would potentially be to have these models be able to um, give a quick interpretation right on the fly um, to give guidance to these experts on things which might be uh, above the expertise, which would normally require a, a, a radiologist. And then we could get follow-up from the radiologist, but where it's needed immediately, we could use those there. Also, um, to expert, to free up resources, there are a number of things. The, the HOD, as I said, also mentioned that things like medicals, for example, where a person is, takes a chest x-ray and they need to know the potential employer or football team or whatever needs to know whether this chest x-ray is normal or not. That's an application which could use AI instead of needing an expert and could free up resources. Another thing she mentioned was age verification, which is a really good um, use case as well, where they look at the bones and see how old someone is. If there's <coughs> sufficient data, we could train AI to do that. So yeah, uh, for the training of the models, we sourced our data from various places. We initially were looking for only data sets which have images of community acquired pneumonia, but we later expanded that to cover other pneumonias. And uh, yeah, that proved very useful. Two of the data sets from uh, our data set hunt are the ones we used to implement the two models. 
Um, so I'll start with uh, what we did, what was common to both models. So both models implemented transfer learning. So this is where we start with a base model, which is already trained, and uh, we either add layers to it or change some of the layers in these models. In both these cases, these, were, these are called convolutional neural networks. So they are there in layers. Right? And so you can tweak certain layers or add layers to it. For the classification model, we just added layers, whereas for the detection model, we, we changed some. And so the base model for the classification model was VGG16. I believe there's VGG19 now, but this is a large, um, a large, uh, a large model trained on a large number of images. It's by TensorFlow. You can you can look it up. It's freely available. Um, yeah, it's a very capable model. And so we got this, and then we just added some more. This is for the classifier. And then for the detection model, we used a modified um, version of uh, MRCNN. So there's a, there's, a, there's a gentleman on GitHub called Matterports, and yeah, so we used his version of MRCNN, which is also another model for detection of items and images like people and things like that, but then we, we twisted it to use that, yeah. Um, so the, um, the interface which we used to evaluate the perceived usefulness of these models had uh, three parts. It had the classification only part, the detection only part, and the combined interface. The technologies used uh, to create these interfaces and the services, I used Flask for uh, the services to interface with the models and make them usable. And I used Next.js 13 for the, the interfaces. Let me just go back a second there. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that, that's what uh, that's what we used there in terms of uh, technologies. Yeah, these models were both um, trained in Kaggle. Um, for the for the for the classification model, we didn't need to use any accelerator because uh, this was the one I implemented first, and uh, um, yeah, at the time I implemented it faster. Many lessons were learned, but yeah, we used. Um, we didn't use any accelerator because it took, I believe, less than two hours. However, we used the um, a, a H100 for the detection model. It's an option there. They give you a maximum of 30 hours a week. It took about, I think, nine hours. It, it was it also we made the, the imagery sizing larger than for the classification model. But uh, yeah, it took it took quite a while. <laughs> but yeah, many, many lessons I learned again. Hopefully, maybe there are people here who we can learn further from and can get one of those for the work we're doing of their expensive GPUs. Yeah. Okay, so I'll move on. So here we have results from our interactions with the experts on how they uh, found the models and the, the, based on the interface. So this particular one is what's called the NASA TLX questionnaire, NASA, sorry, TLX questionnaire which is the task load index. So it just, uh, it's a proven tool which assesses how demanding people perceive the task to be. And as you can see, the air supported workloads were, had lower perceived difficulty than the, than the non-AI perceived workloads, and apart from the frustration index. Um, yes, uh, it seems that uh, perhaps it was a bit of a challenge for people in um, feeling under pressure for the AI aspect, but yeah, in general, people found it a lot less demanding of the task. And so here we have the results from the TAM2 questionnaire. Uh, in this questionnaire, we are assessing uh, how acceptable, how willing to use these tools, people would be to these tools. And so it's carried, it looks over a number of different uh, categories where they intend to use it. That's a series of questions under each category, and then that's where the results are based. Um, yeah, it's a job relevance, whether they think it's relevant to their job, the quality of the outputs, the perceived ease of use, the demonstrability of the results, whether they think it's normal, subjective normal, whether they would voluntarily use these tools. Yeah, so in conclusion, uh, we were able to demonstrate that such tools and models when implemented into workflows for radiologists will be perceived to be helpful and reduce their workload. 
Also, as my colleague was sure, these models can be integrated with the very tools, also known as DICOM readers, that the experts we built them for use every day. Um, and more and more models like these can be created for different modalities if we have the resources, and we intend on doing that with time. So now I'll take you, I'll show you a quick um, interaction with how the models worked. And uh, yes, let me go to that. So as I said there, it had three interfaces, but we were advised, we had a, a focus group where we were advised to use the classifier detector. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you where, uh, this is the interface for evaluating the tools. So we're going to have uh, the user select there, and then select an image that they think is suspicious. This one was assessing only, only pneumonia. And uh, so it's a chest x-ray. And so we open that and the image is presented together with the results of the detection model, which highlight where the areas of the image are con which are considered to be suspicious. So it seems it's uh, the, both the bottom quadrants of both lungs. And uh, also it has some text, which was also we received input from the experts. So the radiograph is considered to be suspicious for pneumonia by a model with 73% uh, confidence. And uh, yes, some other metadata they can see. Um, uh, with that, I will stop sharing and hand over to my colleague here, and I'll be back at question time with the end. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Thanks a lot, Malaysia. Uh, I'll ask, uh, you, you know, Andrew if he's ready for us. And just to mention here that uh, I mean, for people that have not really dove into um, this space of AI, it might seem like uh, stuff that Malaysia was doing was trivial, but uh, quite involving. Uh, he's not a domain expert. He's had to interact with a number of... Uh, you know, experts um, on the other side of town at UTH. So quite exciting stuff here. And Andrew, I think, is ready for us. Over to you, Mr. Shawasan. Uh, 